Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from CMI Creation Station. Last time I dealt with these guys, they were parodying the Big Think Channel's video of Bill Nye talking about why creationism is not appropriate for children. This time, they're looking at beneficial mutations and claiming that they are not evidence for evolution. Well, at least they know that beneficial mutations are actually a thing. Baby steps, people, baby steps. Let's go! Yes, these types of things are often hailed by evolutionists as evidence for evolution. Look, it's evolution happening right before our eyes. You Christians, how silly you are. Can't you see the evidence for evolution happening right here? <laughs> and there we go, starting right off with the us versus them mentality. If only I had a dollar for every time I've had to say this, but not all Christians deny evolution. Christian does not equal creationist. There are plenty of Christians on the side of, hey, look how these gain-of-function mutations demonstrate evolution. But is that really evolution? We could ask questions like, is all change in living things evidence for evolution? No, not all change is evidence for evolution. If I break my leg and it does not heal properly, that's a change in a living thing. It also has nothing to do with evolution. Heritable genetic change is a kind of evidence for evolution in the same sense that watching a gun fire is evidence for the fact that the gun can fire. These changes themselves are a demonstration of one of the mechanisms for evolution, so when you see any heritable genetic change, you are literally watching evolution on a tiny scale. So in that sense, yes, any change that is heritable is evidence for evolution. To specify, though, I'm talking about the kinds of changes that we actually observe. There are hypothetical changes that could definitely occur that would completely falsify evolution, but they remain hypothetical because they simply never happen. What kinds of changes are evidence for evolution? Random ones that then have natural selection act on them. If we see beneficial ones becoming more prevalent and detrimental ones becoming less prevalent in the populations, then that literally is evolution. Are there types of changes that would not be evidence for evolution? Yes. Yes, there are. If someone were to have a child where their genetic code suddenly fixed all the problems with the human body that are a direct result of our evolutionary lineage, this would drastically alter our perception of the mechanisms for evolution. At a minimum, it would require a reevaluation. but there is so much evidence in favor of evolution at this point that even though that change itself would not be positive evidence for evolution, it would also not be sufficient evidence against evolution to call the theory as a whole into question. But to directly answer your question, that is one type of change that would not be positive evidence for evolution. I'm sure there are other, less drastic ones that I'm not thinking of. Check the comment section if you're interested, that's usually where the stuff I don't think of ends up surfacing. Okay, so let's start with the basics. What are mutations and what is the genetic code? Well, the genetic code is like software that runs the hardware of living things. It is analogous to software, yes, but since you're going to try and use the whole it's a software code so who wrote the code line of reasoning, I feel obligated to point out that the analogy is not perfect, not by a long shot. The main reason for this is that you can look at a programmer's code and use your knowledge of the programming language to figure out what that code is supposed to do. The same is not true of DNA. Given a strand of DNA and nothing else, you cannot tell what that DNA will do. What the DNA will do is entirely dependent on the chemical makeup of the cell that it is in. The DNA follows simple chemical rules to produce different results depending on the local chemical makeup. To borrow an illustration from Richard Dawkins, it's much like starlings in a flock. The individual birds follow simple navigational rules that, when taken as a whole, produce elegant-looking flight patterns from the individual level up rather than being directed centrally from the top down. Another good illustration this point is an experiment by the embryologist Roger Sperry, in which he swapped two patches of skin on a tadpole, putting one from its belly onto its back, and vice versa. Once the frog finished metamorphosis, it was found that the neural pathways had developed backward, so if you tickled the patch of skin on the frog's back, it would scratch its belly, and vice versa. Because there is no blueprint telling the nerves where to connect, they send out axons that sniff the appropriate chemical makeup for where they are supposed to connect. So if you take the belly skin and put it on the frog's back, the nerves that are supposed to connect to the belly still find it on the back. If the genetics were a software program that just runs commands that are carried out by the hardware, this would not be the case. It's a very complex instruction code that directs the activities of cells. Every one of your trillions of cells has the complete genetic code to build and operate you. Yes, and that is a complete waste. 
A cell in the retina has no need for the genetic material to produce, say, thyroid hormones. And likewise, thyroid gland cells have no need of the instructions to build structures that will collect light for us to see. Yet both kinds of cells have all those genes, just sitting there, unused, taking up resources. Creationists will often bring up complexity as evidence for creation, but oftentimes the hallmark of good design is simplicity. Don't make it more complex than it needs to be. Our bodies are way more complex than they need to be. Now, without the information written on DNA, life would be impossible. Every time creationists start talking about DNA, they inevitably bring up information. What is your definition of information? What counts as more information? What is less? What about the useless information in our genes, like the gene that, if activated, would result in the synthesis of vitamin C? We have that one, mostly intact, but it is just broken enough to not work. Does it count as information if it's there but doesn't do anything? Do the ten broken copies of the nanog gene that exist within our genome count as information? Information is the new kinds. If you need something to be information, then it is. If it being information would dismantle your point, then you completely ignore it, like the vitamin C gene. Fun fact, the broken nanog genes are one of the ways that we know we are closely related to chimps. They have the same ten broken nanog genes in their genome in the exact same places as ours. Now, evolution says that the single cell went on, over millions of years, to evolve into a multicellular creature, for example, like this. Yeah, pretty much. But do you know what's really neat? One of the steps that creationists often complain is missing has been observed in a lab setting. Single-celled algae were subject to selection pressure that made it more favorable to be larger. In less than a year, two out of five of the algae populations developed the trait of multicellularity as a defense mechanism. When the selection pressure was then removed, multicellularity remained a stably heritable trait for at least another four years as of the publishing of the paper. That's a pretty big evolutionary step, if you ask me. And the selection pressure was simply a filter-feeding amoeba. No messing with mutagenics of any kind, just putting a predator in with the algae that couldn't eat the larger algae. Are you going to try and tell me that the transition from single cell to multi cell didn't involve an addition of information somehow? So the kinds of changes to the genetic code that would be needed involve adding huge amounts of new, never-before-existing genetic instructions to build all of the things that the single cell didn't have. Yep. And we've seen examples of information being added to an organism, no matter how you want to define information. And if we go by the algae experiment, that was in an insanely tiny amount of time, less than one year to develop multicellularity. Now extrapolate that out over a few billion years, and it doesn't take much thought to realize that evolution really is a near-perfect explanation for the life we see today. So then for evolution to work, the central feature, the main thing we should see, is that genetic information is increasing to build all of these bigger and better structures that the single cell didn't have. Not universally increasing. Sometimes it can decrease or take away structures or functions, and that can be a good thing too. But more on that later. Okay, but let's look at some examples. Let's start with antibiotic resistance. Most of you are probably familiar with that term. It occurs when bacteria are found to be resistant to the antibiotics that are meant to kill them. And that can be very dangerous, even deadly, if you happen to have these resistant bacteria. Okay, so this next part, I'm going to just quickly summarize it and skip it because they spend a lot of time on it. So they say that antibiotic resistance is the result of a loss of function mutation. For instance, one of the ways bacteria have been known to become resistant is to be less efficient at pumping material into the cell. The pump becomes less efficient, so less of the antibiotic makes it into the cell, so it's more likely to survive the dose. But under normal circumstances, that would be a detrimental mutation, right? Point right! You're bloody well right. Right. But evolution is not about maintaining normal circumstances, it's about which organisms can adapt to changing circumstances more successfully. If that involves losing something that was helpful in a different environment, then this loss of function is in fact evolution. Also, they mention that several of the mutations that make some of the bacteria antibiotic resistant have been found in specimens of those bacteria that predate the development of antibiotics, and claim that as a gotcha because that means that the information was already there. But here they're getting causality reversed. The presence of a selection pressure does not cause mutations to occur. Mutations occur on their own, and then the selection pressure determines which mutations can survive. It's possible that some of the antibiotic resistant mutations are regular mutations that happen to some individuals in every generation 
coloration. Think something along the lines of heterochromia in mammals, where one eye is a different color than the other one. This is a common mutation that happens to many individuals in every generation. There is no selection pressure for or against it that I am aware of, but let's hypothetically say that in the distant future, aliens invade Earth. People with heterochromia also have another as yet undiscovered function that came along with the mutation, which allows them to survive encounters with the alien weapons for whatever reason. In not much time at all, the majority of the people on Earth will now have the mutation that caused heterochromia. The heterochromia was already there, but the selection pressure changed. That's what this is. Quantity of information has nothing to do with it, and even if what you say in your video is true, and that the superbugs really are defective when compared side to side with their non-super counterparts, the superbugs are still being selected for in environments like hospitals, making their defective mutations an advantage in a hospital setting, where a regular non-defective bug doesn't stand a chance. So now I'm skipping quite a bit of their video, the link to the original is down in the description. I don't think I skipped anything terribly important, but if there's one thing that Responding to Creationists has taught me, it's that you should always check your sources. So don't take my word for it that I'm not skipping anything important, go see for yourself. Darwin called attention to wingless beetles on the island of Madeira. It's often windy on Madeira, and many of the normal winged beetles get blown off the island into the sea and, or the ocean and they die. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> There was a mutation that caused some of the beetles to lose the ability to produce wings. The wingless mutant beetles then became the dominant population on the island, and that's still the situation today. Yep, a loss of function was more favorable in that situation than to keep that function. Evolution by natural selection in action, baby! So, a genetic mutation causing a loss of wings caused population change over time. Which is literally the definition of evolution. Have fun twisting this one around. So just like in the example of antibiotics, the beetles have become adapted to their environment, in this case as a result of a mutation. Uh, these wingless beetles are now better adapted to the windy environment than the non-mutant winged beetles. Uh, that's a great example of natural selection and adaptation, but it's not evolution. How so? Because the wings went away? Are you still confused? It's about the kind of change that took place. The beetles used to have wings, now they don't. That's actually the opposite of what evolution needs. Why? Evolution needs there to be a change in allele frequency in a population over generations. That's it. When the beetles first got to the island, the allele that resulted in wings was more common than the one that would result in no wings. Over time, the allele that got rid of the wings became more common than the one providing the wings. The allele frequency changed in the population over generations. Evolution. They've lost the ability to fly. If they keep losing abilities, eventually they're going to lose the ability to live. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, that sounds more like uh, extinction, not evolution. <laughs> Tell that to the ants. Remember when I said that sometimes decreasing inability or function could be a good thing? Ants are members of the Hymenoptera order. They are very closely related to wasps. Some 150 to 200 million years ago, ants lost their wings, mostly. The queens and males still have wings, but the wings aren't useful when you live most of your life underground. The males die shortly after the mating flight, and the queens will chew off their own wings before burrowing underground to start a new colony, as their wings are a hindrance in their subterranean domain. Now you guys are sitting around here joking about how if these beetles keep going down the path that caused them to lose their wings, they'll end up extinct. Well... Ants already went down that path, and they are arguably the most successful animal species on the planet, weighing in at 15% of all land animal biomass, with between 10 and 20,000 individual species. So this is an excellent example of a loss of function mutation that resulted in crazy success. <laughs> By the way, creationists wrote on natural selection and adaptation long before Darwin. Yep, they sure did. As with 99.9% .9 of science, Darwin was building on ideas that had been put forward before him. In fact, because of how cumulative the scientific process is, there's actually a law known as Stigler's Law of Eponymy, which states that no scientific discovery is named after its original discoverer. And this includes Stigler's Law, which is named after Stephen Stigler, who wrote about it in 1980, but who credited sociologist Robert K. Merton with its discovery. This happens because every major breakthrough that is so profound as to be noticed by the general public is the end result of a long train of minor breakthroughs that weren't really all that exciting. 
Darwin was alive at a time when the discovery of evolution by natural selection was probably inevitable as long as there were scientists, or naturalists as they were called then, studying the diversity of species. And before Darwin, most European naturalists were some form of creationist, simply because Christianity was so prevalent at the time, and God fit nicely into that little gap in their knowledge. Uh, those are scientific facts supported by a lot of good examples. God created living things with the amazing ability to adapt to changing environments without going extinct at the slightest climate change, for example. Uh, it's good engineering. It's exactly what we'd expect if God created. Is it, though? God designed organisms with the ability to adapt. But the adaptation comes at the cost of killing off everything that wasn't able to adapt. Seems to me like a superior design would be to provide a stable climate. Someone who owns a fish tank, for instance, doesn't design it in a way that will regularly kill off all but the most adaptable individuals in the tank. They design their aquariums with care to provide the most stable environment possible to give long and healthy lives to their fish. Why does a human keeping fish seem to care more about the fish than God cares about the creatures of the earth? Yes, I know, the fall. When God made people without knowing right from wrong, and then he put a tree in the middle of their home with magic fruit that would give them the knowledge of right and wrong, then they, without having the ability to know it was wrong, ate from the tree, forcing God to curse all the animals with shifting climates that would often kill a lot of them, but still give them the ability to adapt so that they wouldn't die off? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Exactly. That's right. Think of the term beneficial mutation. Evolutionists use that term quite a bit, but is there such a thing as a beneficial mutation? Yes, there is. You've already pointed out several examples, some of which I skipped over for the sake of time. No doubt you're about to point out that oftentimes there is a trade-off where the benefit of the mutation is tempered by something detrimental, which is actually kind of expected if this is all part of some natural process, but not at all expected if we were perfectly designed with mutations being one of the mechanisms that leads to favorable characteristics for natural selection. Remember literally 10 seconds ago when you were talking about how an organism's ability to adapt was designed by God? Mutations are how that happens. If there are no beneficial mutations without some sort of negative trade-off, that's a bad design, is it not? Yes, there is. <laughs> what? A creationist admitting that beneficial mutations are a thing? Is this a trick? What's your angle here? See, the thing is, once you admit that the genetic code is capable of spontaneously changing in a way that benefits the organism, then there's really no way you can stop these changes from accumulating over time to produce the diversity of species that we now see. You've already admitted that natural selection is a thing, and now you're admitting that the genetic code can change favorably. Do you not see how these two things together drive evolution? You guys are so close. A beneficial mutation is simply one that makes it possible for its possessors to contribute more offspring to future generations than the creatures that lack the mutation. Yes, such as the two whole genome duplication events that happened in the precursor to angiosperm plants that enabled them to produce seeds rather than spores for reproduction. Check out this video by Jackson Wheat for more information about the evolution of plants and flowers. The mutation in these beetles can be called a beneficial mutation. Uh, I guess, uh, from a certain point of view. So what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. Yeah, and right there you completely accidentally hit the nail right on the head. The environment is what determines whether or not any given mutation is beneficial. So on a windy island where flying beetles get blown out to sea and die, the loss of wings is beneficial, but on the mainland that would just make them easy prey for anything that wants to eat them. In a hospital environment where antibiotics are being administered to many patients, a defective pump that stops the bacteria from getting a lethal dose of antibiotics is beneficial, but out in the wild where no antibiotics are present, it just makes it less efficient so it will be outcompeted. There isn't some objective measure by which we determine how beneficial or detrimental any given mutation is, it's just whether or not that mutation helps the organism reproduce in its environment. This is why a physical barrier of some kind is such a prevalent feature in examples of diversification. The physical barriers create ecological islands that expose the organisms to different environments from their cousins. Uh, but it's not beneficial for evolution. <laughs> The mutation puts the beetle on the path to extinction. Yeah, just like the ants. They've been without wings for over a hundred million years now. Poor things are almost gone from this planet. We need to act now to save the ants. It's becoming genetically worse. You just admitted that it was better from a certain point of view. How are you now backpedaling and say it's genetically worse? That doesn't follow. 
If it works better for the Beatles in their current environment, it is better. It is a beneficial mutation. Better does not equal worse. And what counts as better or worse is determined almost entirely by the environment the organism lives in. And that's the point. At a genetic level, it's going downhill, not uphill. The exact opposite of evolution. Have these beetles had their genome sequenced and compared to their winged counterparts? How do you know that the mutation that caused their wings to not develop was one that took genetic material out? It could have been a substitution mutation where the amount of genetic material remains the same. It could have been a deletion, sure, which would result in less genetic material. It could also have been an insertion. You can't just assume that since a feature of the organism went away that it was a deletion. The amount of genetic material contained in an organism does not necessarily correlate with how many features that organism has, which is why it's important for your argument that you define information. Because if you're just counting the amount of genetic material as information, then an addition of information in an insertion mutation can sometimes cause features to go away or stop working, so that's more information that produces fewer features. And all this is not to mention that evolution doesn't even have a direction, so you can't go in the opposite direction of evolution. There are no goals with evolution other than reproduction, so even when a change takes away a feature of an organism, if this change assists the reproductive success of that organism, that is still evolution. Now I'm going to skip the sickle cell anemia example because once again we see that it is beneficial in assisting people not to die of malaria before they can reproduce, but it's detrimental because of all the other health problems that it can cause later in life. You know, the kind of thing we would expect if evolution by natural selection was naturally driven in an unguided manner, rather than simply natural selection being programmed by an omniscient creator. I'm also skipping their stomach bacteria example because it's just another mechanism of antibiotic resistance which we've already discussed, so I'm not sure why they kept it for a separate segment when they already covered it. And by the way, adding millions of years isn't the answer. Why not? We know that mutations can benefit the organisms that have those mutations. You've admitted this in your video. We know that natural selection will favor these organisms. You've admitted this in your video. Combine these two facts that you have admitted are in fact facts with millions of years, and you get diversity as different organisms have different mutations that benefit them in different ways than their ancestors and cousins. Your only complaint is that no new information is added, but you haven't defined information in any meaningful way. And no matter how you define it, there will be examples of organisms that gain information through mutations. If it is a product of a new structure or function, then the ApoA1 Milano mutation is an example. It's a new protein, a mutated version of the apple lipoprotein A1 found in human HDL. But this new protein is produced without the addition of genetic material. It's a substitution mutation where the amino acid arginine is replaced by cysteine at position 173 of the protein. This would correspond to a point mutation in the DNA that replaced no more than two nucleotide bases, but possibly only one single point. New structure, no new genetic material, just slightly different genetic material. Is that new information? But then if we define information as the amount of genetic material, then there are mutations that add genetic material into the genome, but this material does nothing. Think back to the example I gave where we have 11 copies of the Nanog gene, one that works, and 10 that are broken. Every time it was erroneously copied into another part of the genome, that was an addition of information, but it resulted in no new structures or functions. So information is to genetics as kinds is to taxonomy. It means whatever you want it to mean in any given situation in order for evolution to not be true. The point is the direction of the change. Right. If the sorts of changes that scientists see happening in living things, like the examples we mentioned today, continue for millions of years, those creatures will be extinct. Why? Returning to the ants, they lost their wings millions of years ago, and they're doing just fine. You also purposely chose mutations that look like they're going in the wrong direction in the directionless process that is evolution. I provided examples like the ApoA1 Milano mutation that are going in a positive direction. Resistance to heart disease is a beneficial mutation, and as far as I'm aware, there have been no detrimental effects discovered that result from this mutation. Which is actually surprising. When your system for the diversification of life relies on unguided mutations that are encouraged or discouraged purely by the environment of the organism, you would expect that most mutations, even the beneficial ones, would have some sort of adverse consequences like sickle cell anemia. They will not have evolved into something bigger or better or more robust. All groups of living things are getting worse over time, not better. Demonstrably incorrect. 
Better and worse are almost entirely functions of the environment in which these organisms are found. You gave examples of organisms getting better in their environments and then calling it worse because it wouldn't have worked out as well in their old environments. But that's exactly the point. You change the selection pressures and what counts as better or worse also changes. And that's it for this one. Now, as mentioned, I have cut out quite a bit of their video, so feel free to go check and make sure I'm not skipping over any important details that would have completely undermined my points. I mean, I'm not, but don't take my word for it. Today's comment of the day actually comes to me through a letter I received in my P.O. box. The sender wants to remain anonymous, but there are a couple of points they made that I would like to discuss. First, I want to mention that the sender is mostly blind and started their letter with an apology for any typos as they can't see what they have typed so won't be able to see mistakes to correct them. The apology was completely unnecessary as there are very few typos. The letter was better composed than a significant number of comments written by individuals who can see what they wrote. But let's start with their first point. They wrote, Your video is not barrier-free for the blind. You seem to use visuals without reading them aloud for your blind audience. I know that most YouTubers are not aware of blind people watching or rather listening to YouTube. We are as eager to learn what you have to say as your sighted audience. We would greatly appreciate the extra effort to read out or describe visuals so that we can follow your line of argument. Unfortunately, yes, I am guilty as charged, but let me start by saying that my workflow for making videos is not very conducive to reading my visuals out. I write my script usually without any knowledge of what visuals I will be using in the future when editing, and I try to find visuals that fit what I've already said while I'm putting the video together. Now, personally, I am the type of person who likes to listen to content similar to what I make in the background while I do other things, like cleaning or driving, so I actually do work to minimize how much impact the visuals will have on my overall point, specifically because I don't want people like me to miss out on anything important, so hopefully that does help reassure you that you aren't missing much, but I will try to keep this in mind and be more considerate in the future. The next part of the letter is rather lengthy, so I will summarize here. They're responding to my statement in the first video of my Pseudoscience Uprising playlist, where I said that I think ultimately the question of free will doesn't matter, because it appears as though we do have free will, so we should act as though we have free will. Their reply to this, as I understand it, essentially boils down to the idea that since we don't have free will, nobody is ultimately responsible for their position in life, be it favorable or unfavorable. To act as though they were responsible for it would encourage harmful behavior, such as victim blaming someone who's born into poverty and can't seem to escape it, or praising someone for working hard and improving their situation. Now, I can definitely see the point here. If you act as though we have free will, then obviously every poor person should act to reduce their poverty, right? When in fact it is ultimately not their fault. But my point in saying that we should act as though we have free will is not to say that we should praise rich people and blame poor people for their plight. I was thinking more along the lines that criminals should face justice for their crimes even though it is possible that they didn't actually have a choice in committing them. So what I'm getting at is that we should act as though we have free will, but also recognize that our will can't overcome all the situations. Poor people are not choosing to be poor. A lot of rich people didn't do anything to deserve their wealth. We should absolutely maintain sufficient social programs so that every Everybody has their basic needs met. And yes, that does include healthcare for all. Maybe as a Canadian I'm a bit biased, but it seems to me like it would be easier to make the climb out of poverty if you don't have to pay anywhere from a hundred to potentially a few thousand dollars just to see a doctor. So remember to follow me on all the social media things and support me on all the financial things, and all the links for all that stuff is in the description, as well as my P.O. Box address if you want to send me stuff in the mail. If you do send me stuff, remember to tell me if you want to stay anonymous. See you next time! And now I would just like to give special thanks to the YouTube channel The Storm Cometh, who not only generously provided me with my current intro and outro clips, but also quickly put together the one that I used in last week's video for Shannon Q on very short notice. Here's his channel trailer, and feel free to go check him out.